and welcome to LFS 2021. We're back. We're back for our second year and we are so glad. We really are so glad that you can join us. Our first speaker, our first guest this year is Andreas Katsidakis. Just checking I've got that surname correctly. Hi, Andreas. Hello. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, we're very well. Well, we were just having a, um, a quick conversation before we started the recording. Yes. Andreas is actually in Greece. I myself, I'm in Bahrain. And lovely Julia is, uh, is in the UK flying the flag for us. <laughs> so the second year of Liverpool Fashion Summit, um, we've gone international, we've gone global, probably, probably um, quicker than we wanted to, but there we are. Andreas, why don't you give us uh, a 30 second introduction um, of who you are, um, uh, where you work, and, and the research that you're interested in. Right, okay, so um, I'm a professor of marketing in, uh, at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, I have been at Royal Holloway since 2007, so quite some time now. And um, in terms of research, um, it is fair to say that I have been working more broadly on the intersection of consumption with ethics and politics. I think that's the common theme underpinning my research. Uh, more recently, I have looked at issues around uh, slavery and worker exploitation in the extent to which consumers can be mobilized and should be mobilized in the fight against uh, slavery and labor exploitation. But I have also looked at um, uh, various other um, manifestations of consumer activism, if you like, from um, uh, various different movements in Greece um, during the economic crisis and after, uh, in the way of alternative economies, sharing economies, and so on and so forth. Um, I have also worked quite a bit on psychoanalytic approaches to um, consumer ethics, and um, more recently also I have been working with uh, the Care Collective, on uh, the so-called CARE manifesto that just got published uh, a few months ago with Verso. And uh, CARE has become a major uh, preoccupation of mine um, since. Uh, so I'm trying currently to apply it uh, into consumption in a more extensive and hopefully sophisticated way. Wow, what a CV. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, the, the theme of, of Liverpool Fashion Summit this year is very much around your, your core research, uh, research interest, Andreas, um, consumption and the ethics of consumption as well. Um, I think before, before I start firing really difficult questions at you, um, let's, let's talk very briefly about the, the research that um, you published. I think it was last summer, mm -hmm. am I right? And it was um, it was about the the intersection of and correct me if I'm wrong of course about the intersection of modern slavery um, within goods and services and and consumers and there was something that, I hope you don't mind if I quote something from your paper but there was something I picked out that I think really sums up um, uh, the research and that paper quite well. So what was said was um, consumers are strongly implicated in modern slavery practices, not only through actual demand for slave based services and products, but also as a stakeholder and or dominant figure employed by various other stakeholders in public debates and policies relating to modern day slavery. Now, obviously, some might hear that and go, wow, that is a quite a provocative uh, statement and it's quite a challenging thing to hear. Reflecting back on that on that research now, um, how do you reflect on it? How does how does that research make you feel now in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah. Well, that's a very good uh, question. Um, right. So what we meant by that, and actually uh, we're not the uh, first to make this argument. Although maybe we are the first to make it, the argument within the more specific context of uh, modern slavery and labor exploitation. Uh, but uh, the argument has been going on for a while and it has to do with um, debates around uh, responsibilizing the consumer or even if you like consumer bashing and expecting 
uh, from consumers to basically um, uh, bear the weight of, you know, uh, addressing all sorts of different uh, social and environmental injustices through their everyday consumption choices. And uh, various commentators have um, argued this is not quite fair, you know, in fact, it is very much uh, interlinked with the uh, neoliberal um, realities that we live in. And uh, actually, we should be very careful uh, uh, as to when and how uh, we ask consumers to do their own bit, you know, uh, in relation to various different issues of social and environmental justice. So I think what we had in mind when we wrote that was, okay, of course, sometimes we should ask consumers to uh, buy or not buy uh, with specific ethical and political considerations in mind. But, but we should also try to think a bit more um, political, if you like, in terms of how we can mobilize the consumer, uh, not necessarily as an individual, but as a key stakeholder, as a key constituency, that uh, it just so happens that uh, corporations do take into account, and so do various other governmental bodies. So you don't necessarily have to ask consumers to buy or not buy uh, things in order to elevate their voice. Right? Uh, you can find other ways of, um, in a way, um, um, harnessing some of the power that consumers have, you know, in terms of demand side of things, right? By appealing to what they think, by appealing to reputation risks, right? By somehow trying to collectivize what otherwise remains as an individual um, opinion or individual choices. So basically try to think more creatively about how to mobilize the consumer in quotation marks without actually necessarily asking or demanding that consumers go about their everyday lives trying to make all sorts of difficult choices and feeling guilty about it right yeah if that does that make sense yeah yeah okay. i mean so many questions <laughs> yes. come out of it that thing you said about yeah. responsibilizing the consumer yeah oh, let's do another whole yeah so it's a it's not an easy no. term yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Not, not an easy term mm. to pronounce either. But mm. so, so with within your research, then, because um, mm -hmm. I, I did read it top to bottom, and I believe it's open access at the moment, Andreas. Oh, I, I, I'm not, um, you know, happy to hear. I wasn't aware of that. But <laughs> well, on, at, at the moment, I believe it's open yeah. access. So maybe okay. we can link to it because I'm sure a lot mm -hmm. of people would like to read it. But there was some, there was some. Um, some of the interviews that you did within that research, there was a lot of interesting responses, mm. I think, to the questions that you actually asked um, 40 or so consumers in the research. Mm -hmm. and, and you, um, maybe I'm saying this wrong, thematically categorized them or, or coded <laughs> those types of responses um, into, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, neutralizing techniques. Mm -hmm and legitimizing techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just reflect on, on those two for us? So, yeah, um, so it's a good question, right? So what we mean by neutralizing um, techniques, basically, which again is a, perhaps a difficult term uh, that is used to describe basically the kind of uh, justifications or rationalizations we give to others and to ourselves uh, when it comes to uh, not behaving in the most, uh, let's say, ethical way possible, right? Mm -hmm. So neutralizations uh, have to do with um, uh, the kind of excuses or justifications that we use to uh, somehow explain why, let's say, we do not act in relation to modern slavery, although we have the capacity to do so, right? Um, mm -hmm. Things like, oh, my individual behavior won't make much of a difference. Uh, um, uh, oh, but actually some uh, slaves or exploited workers uh, had it coming, you know, they are not necessarily victims as such. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, it's not me, it should be the government doing its own bit, etc, etc. How we use these sets of um, excuses or justifications across different contexts, yeah, uh, with a view to justify an action and alleviate any potential feelings of guilt we would otherwise have, yeah. Uh, in relation to that in action. Um, having said that, um, it's important to also clarify and that this has been misunderstood actually uh, in relation to this uh, study and beyond. Uh, we do not necessarily qualify them as excuses, right? Uh, some of them can be very valid, right? So when, for example, consumers uh, 
say, um, you know, it should be the government that uh, um, uh, should be doing more in relation to modern slavery, not myself, or businesses. You know, that is actually a very uh, legit uh, way of looking at things. We're not saying it's an excuse as in, you know, uh, a defensive, some kind of, some kind of a defensive uh, response. Uh, it could also be a valid reason. We do not necessarily distinguish between uh, defensive versus um, legitimate uh, accounts in that sense, right? Uh, what we are focusing on is what these accounts do, right? Not what they are. So we're not focusing, you know, following the um, a very specific sociological tradition, if you like, uh, that looks at these um, accounts uh, in terms of what they do as opposed to what the real nature is. Yeah, uh, we just focus on what they do and what they do in the context of uh, slavery and uh, uh, work exploitation is they remove uh, responsibility from the individual consumer. And rightly or not rightly uh, is a different uh, matter, but it is important to first identify how responsibility is removed before we discuss whether it should or it should not be removed from the individual consumer. Yeah, and I think um, yeah. I didn't actually think of that when I was reading reading mm -hmm. through it as well. I think because you know modern slavery is such a ethically, morally, politically charged, sensitive topic. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, it probably naive uh, of me as a reader to 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 go in that without uh, accepting my bias is going to be throughout that reading. But mm. so I like I like. I like that um, that answer that you just gave. In that, it's it's more it's an observation rather than rather than a critique of the consumer. If I've understood that correctly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, with everything that you know throughout that research and uh, the the rest of your your uh, your research and your knowledge in in general, then Andreas, do you think consumers are ready to shop ethically? Right. Um, well, um, <laughs> well, consumer here is used as a unifying category, and we know that doesn't exist, right? There's no such thing yeah. as, you know, the consumer, um, unless we are in rhetorical, you know, territories. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say um, we have indications of both um, positive and negative um, uh, responses to this question, right? Um, on the one hand, of course, we know that the ethical fashion market is um, doing pretty well. We have more and more ethical brands. And, um, you know, you probably know this much more than I do because I'm not a fashion expert. But on the other, of course, we have um, scandals like the Boohoo scandal. And one of the uh, things um, we all realize there is that uh, consumers actually do not... Uh, care about um, ethical considerations. Uh, you know, they want to uh, carry on consuming ethically or otherwise, right? So the, the apparent lack of any effective uh, response, yeah, uh, from the consumer side, yeah, to the Buhu scandal, you know, um, should uh, be a, you know, point of reflection for all of us, right? So consumers can be uh, very uh, uncaring uh, in that sense. And uh, okay, as I said earlier, we don't necessarily want uh, consumers to be the ones that um, um, carry the weight in their shoulders when it comes to social and environmental justice. But when we have companies like Buhu getting away with um, um, you know, extreme labor exploitation and actually enjoying and increasing their sales, right? Uh, then we have to ask, you know, um, what is the potential reputation risk for corporations like Boohoo? You know, zero by implication. Yeah. And what, you know, that is not necessarily good. You know, um, we would, you know, we would, we do want at least um, um, the reputational damage to be significant enough uh, to make sure that um, uh, cases like this do not um, happen. You know, uh, it is, it, it does make, I think it makes us, makes everyone very pessimistic uh, about the future of uh, worker exploitation when we see, um, you know, uh, Western consumers being so oblivious to any 
um, uh, politics of production around the products that they consume, right? Uh, yeah. We need somehow, um, we need a bit more of a, um, you know, we need uh, consumers to reconnect uh, with producers. And of course, there are far more radical ways of doing so, uh, as opposed to just not buying Boohoo, right? But, you know, it is, should be, you know, should be a starting point, um, especially when it comes to scandals such as this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what one of the ways that that we or rather that I have observed is that because I'm I'm actively since moving into this type of research in this space, I'm actively trying to consume not necessarily less because I don't think stopping consumption altogether is the answer, but consume better, consume more ethically. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that has helped me personally and has helped some of some people I know is you know increased access to information about mm -hmm. products about suppliers mm -hmm. about brands about goods but when julie and i were talking the other day you know it's kind of that how how does how does a consumer judge the validity of any available information in what we know is an ever-growing um internet of, mm. of information and and, and the noise <laughs> How does one try to cut through that? Yeah, okay. That's a very good question, right? And, uh, you know, from the outset, I guess things have moved quite a bit since the first, uh, I think, um, in some accounts, the first Consumers League, you know, that actively tried to um, uh, gain information uh, about uh, retailers' practices. Uh, was uh, established in 1897, at least in the UK, by Clementina Black, and I think it was a group of consumers basically that, um, you know, were concerned around um, um, the different retailers in the vicinity of, you know, Bond Street, Oxford Street and Regent Street, and um, they were interested in basically boycotting and boycotting, yeah, um, different uh, retailers on the basis of uh, working conditions within their factories, right? Um, since then, uh, things have moved uh, quite a bit in terms of wealth of information and uh, richness of information, right? I, I mean, let's not forget that um, 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 the ethical consumer uh, organization has been around for um, decades now, you know, and they tend to uh, publicize quite a, a lot of uh, reads and, you know, um, uh, valid information in relation to all sorts of different um, businesses, right? But we also have applications like um, the buy, is it buy court or the boycott app that you can directly scan and find out about the histories of the products that we buy, you buy. So I, I will not think necessarily that information is now the issue in the way it was, mm. you know, back in the days. I mean, by the way, as a footnote, that I think one of the reasons why that consumer sleek uh, dissolved was because finding all the information was impossible back in 1897. I wouldn't say this is the case now. I mean, tech, you know, technological advances um, uh, allow us to um, basically increase, if you like, uh, transparency um, in supply chains, etc., to a very large extent, not to a full extent, but to a large extent. But I don't think transparency necessarily is the issue. You know, the issue is, um, in that sense, not about information. It's more about um, what is the best way of addressing um, um, exploitation and modern slavery. Because uh, information, in a way, implicit in the model of the information, to some extent, is that you know violations happen here and there, and it's all about us finding out where. Uh, violations happen and acting accordingly uh, in some instances. That is true, but also it's about realizing that the causes of uh, slavery and worker exploitation are also systemic. And in that sense, fighting for more deep-seated um, socioeconomic chains that, you know, cannot be reduced to, you know, uh, single uh, corporations, um, you know, being busted for, you know, engaging in dodgy um, uh, worker practices, right? Yeah. Um, so I think information is one thing and 
but another is cultivating the right kind of conscience that is needed in order to work towards um, more uh, caring um, world, uh, both in terms of um, human and non-human uh, forms of life, if you like, yeah, both in terms of social and environmental justice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going. I'm going to have to read up on that um, ethical consumer organisation. Was it? What did you say? 1890. 1897. I just uh, checked, double checked, according to at least my yeah. notes. That's when the Consumers UK Consumers League was uh, established by Clementina oh. Black. Right? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, there are all sorts of different. I'm aware that there are all sorts of different um, historical accounts of ethical consumption when exactly uh, did it begin who were the main actors uh, mm -hmm. you know from i don't know from the bread riots right uh, to accounts of um, uh, ancient greeks talking about the ethics of slavery you know yeah. in the face of them enjoying very you know affluent lifestyles you know so when exactly um, you know the genealogy if you like of um, ethical consumption in that sense uh, can be quite a, a complicated one and a very rich one, depending on what you identify as the starting point. But uh, the UK Consumers League is definitely uh, cited as one of the most uh, prominent, if not the first prominent example of organized consumer action, as we understand it today, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, well, we will, we'll have to, have to look that up. Um, I'm just wary of time, Andrea. So yeah, yeah. If it's okay with you. I'd just like to ask you mm -hmm. one one last question, and it comes back to that mm -hmm. responsibilizing the consumer, mm -hmm. and it is going to be a, a, a very binary question. Um, but okay. we we know that there are that 99% of the answer is within the the grey. Mm -hmm. um, based on everything you know, where does the the burden of responsibility for modern slavery and consumption lie? Is it with consumers? Is it with businesses? Or is it with governments? Right. OK, that's a very, very big question, a very complicated one, and very contentious, right? Um, yeah. uh, to begin with, I, I would say, um, I mean, on the, let's say, from the more um, um, on the many people on the left are very suspicious of any attempt to mobilize the consumer, and uh, there's also a lot of suspicion increasingly uh, with using the term of modern slavery to do so, as opposed to worker exploitation. And the argument in that sense goes that worker exploitation is endemic to our current uh, socioeconomic system, and uh, by uh, detracting from that and speaking of specific cases of extreme labor exploitation or slavery, we are actually misrepresenting the real picture and we are asking people to address their own, um, uh, their own um, manifestations, right, of what is a much deeper um, underlying um, cause, right? Uh, to some extent, I agree with that and I definitely agree that um, we should definitely uh, rely primarily on governmental bodies and businesses when it comes to addressing we need different we need new business models we need new um, uh, ultimately we need a new um, uh, modes of production right uh, the current um, ones that we have are um, clearly uh, conducive uh, to uh, work exploitation. I think that should be clear to anyone who is bothering to take note, right? Uh, we also need, yes, we also need tighter um, um, governmental and intergovernmental um, um, interventions, right? Um, and we need the kind of national and transnational bodies that are going to be powerful enough to take it against uh, powerful corporations, right? Uh, but I don't necessarily agree with saying, okay, consumers then can, you know, take the back seat and not do anything. Else. I, you know, they should be primarily uh, doing so in their capacity as citizens, uh, not as consumers. Uh, but 
they are um, uh, consumers or citizens, if you like, are a key stakeholder. Uh, the demand side of um, slavery and worker exploitation uh, is all about consumers. And if consumers, let's say in the context of fashion, uh, all they care about is lower prices, no matter what, there will always be businesses that will be pushing for the lowering of uh, the production costs, no matter what, right? So we need to cultivate a different sense of a collective conscience and different routes to um, activist um, um, initiatives, right? Uh, that will be effective in terms of um, cultivating a broader um, based understanding of what is going on in our current socioeconomic system. But I don't, just to clarify, I don't, I do think we should care about what consumers think and we should try to um, help consumers, broadly speaking, without sounding very patronizing here. We should try to uh, help consumers um, identify appropriate pathways to action that may you know, uh, in the interim, help us achieve certain positive outcomes, right? Um, that's, I guess, and I will stop here because I'm conscious that uh, that was a very long response to your question. No, it, it, was, yeah. it was brilliant. I mean, one thing I took out of that, um, and I did feel it uh, just a little bit earlier in the interview. I don't know whether I like the word consumer. I don't mm. know when, how I would feel you know, sitting on the other end of this, being called a, a consumer, and you've done it perfectly, Andreas, the consumers are also citizens, mm. they're also workers, they're all, they're, they play multiple roles within, as within what you just mentioned, um, a systemic issue. Um, yeah, I think, because we should not forget that the subjectivity of the consumer is a main uh, driving force if yeah. what we understand by the subjectivity of the consumer is more of a uh, possessive individualized uh, uh, mode of being that is all about, you know, uh, self-enhancement and uh, competitive differentiation through consumption, right? Yeah. I guess that's a more bourgeois understanding of the consumer subjectivity. But if that's what we have in mind when we talk about consumers, yeah, that's the kind of um, logic that we also have to fight against, right? Uh, yeah. We need, you know, we need a more citizenly, as uh, Kate Sober uh, puts it in her um, recent book, we need a more citizenly approach to consumer activism, basically. Yeah, and I think the other thing that you, you quite eloquently put for me, or, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we, we, we also have a role to educate the consumer as well, um, mm -hmm. and to both allow them to seek out information but also to bring this kind of information to them um, mm -hmm. and hopefully this is what we'll be able to do this year um, we'll leave it there andreas thank you thank you so much thank you as well yeah pleasure speaking to you and um yeah hopefully we'll yeah, I, hope I hope we'll, i hope we will meet face to face uh, in next year's conference yes <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely